Hi guys, um, if you are interested in coaching, go to www.coachcatwithak.org. Feel free to like and subscribe to this. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the benefits of forgiveness, forgiving a narcissist. Should I do it? Is it necessary? How do we do it? Um, those sorts of things. So what are some of the benefits of forgiveness? Well, really forgiveness is not about the other person. It is not about condoning what they've done. What it's really about is it's about the the person who's forgiving getting free, getting free of those ties that bind, you know, cutting the cord, getting, you know, free of the negativity that that unforgiveness is bringing into your own soul, your own being, your own heart. Um, from a scientific perspective, there's a lot of like actual health benefits to forgiveness. Um, you have a, there's a decrease in mental health issues. Um, there's a decrease in physical issues. People that are able to forgive typically have a lower level of anxiety, depression, anger, and a greater sense of just pure ease and comfort. So some of the, there's, there's you know, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual sort of um, benefits of forgiveness. It has an increase in your sense of well-being and your feelings of hopeless or uh, hope for the future. Um, so being willing to forgive in general as a person is, is predictive of better overall relationships and relational satisfaction. Um, if you have friends that you're close to, you know that there's been times where things haven't gone well, you may have had some conflict, being able to work through that, communicate it, have sort of a restorative experience and sort of um, that leads to, you know, uh, forgiveness. You know, it's very necessary to be able to have communication and forgiveness in, in relationships. And that's especially true of long-term relationships. So let's, let's kind of look at um, how, how is forgiveness sort of conceptualized? How do we conceptualize forgiveness? Well, um, <coughs> excuse me, for a lot of people, it means like letting go of the anger letting go of those negative feelings, letting go of the ruminations or the perseverations, like letting that all go. And this is easier said than done, I get it. Um, and some, in some realms, it can even be sort of looking at relating positively to the offender, whether that be in your thoughts, in your feelings, or actually in your behavior. Sometimes, you know, forgiveness for some people may mean that you actually have like a, a, reconcil a reconciliatory experience, like you, you know, there's reconciliation. Now that might not be plausible or even healthy when it comes to a narcissist, but we'll get to that. So there's different types of forgiveness. Um, we kind of look at sort of, if you're looking at like redemptive forgiveness, it has almost a sort of um, theological or spiritual or sort of divine um, connotation that like redemptive forgiveness is like a return to wholeness, a return to wellness. And sometimes it has like um, almost the idea, like a theological component or the idea of divinity or God, right? Um, not always, but that's sort of, it's like almost a spiritual type of forgiveness. And then another way to look at it is like the forensic forgiveness. And that's kind of how we look at it, like in the criminal justice system, um, where there's some sort of penalty or it's very transactional where, you know, the offender has some sort of penance to pay for the harms that they've caused. We have that, we have this kind of forensic forgiveness, like set up in our, you know, criminal justice system, at least to a certain degree. And that usually involves, you know, an apology, the offender apologizes, the victim forgives, whether that be in the form of penance and jail time or, um, you know, somebody apologizes to you, you accept their forgiveness. Then there is sort of therapeutic forgiveness. And I've been listening to a lot of like um, uh, Dr. Craig Malcolm and Dr. Um, Grande, like a bunch of different um, sort of psychologists on this and how they look at it is a little bit differently but therapeutic forgiveness is has like three components like the first is you know experiencing the emotional pain um that's the first step like lamenting the wrongdoing like experiencing the darkness the wrongdoing the pain walking through that pain walking through that grief that's the first step and then um, and again, um, this is actually pointed out that this is, um, so sorry, but the second stage is um, the empathy. So being able to put yourself into the offender's shoes and imagine what it 
feels like to be them or to sort of understand the point of view or the worldview of the offender, to be able to empathize with the offender. And this is one reason why cluster Bs actually get really, really stuck and they have a really hard time forgiving other people because they actually get stuck on this, they don't have this ability to be able to sort of empathize with the other, with other people because they have that sort of blindness and they don't have, um, a, they don't have like the emotional empathy. So they have a very, very hard time seeing the point of view or the worldview or the, um, you know, the other person's perspective. That's why cluster Bs or narcissists are all, always in a state of unforgiveness. It's very hard for them. I don't, I don't know if they ever actually forgive others. These are like grudge holders, like till the day they die because they don't have that emotional empathy, the ability to emotionally empathize with another person. They can't really make it through that, that empathy stage. And then there's the third stage and sort of therapeutic forgiveness. And that is, you know, kind of developing in your own life and your own worldview, sort of a, a lifestyle of forgiveness where it is actually a priority for you or it's one of your core values. And it's like developing the virtue of forgiveness. Like this is important to me. Like I want to be a forgiving person. I don't want to live in resentment. I don't want to live in anger. It's really important to me that I do forgive others because I have, this is a core value that's very important to me. And I want to have this like virtue of forgiveness or a lifestyle that, that is um, a spiritual practice that, that is, makes forgiveness a top priority. Because again, you know, we know that forgiveness sets you free. It's not about condoning what they did. It's not about saying what you did was okay. It's not even about the other person. It's really about you being able to free yourself from the ties that bind, cut the cord, right? So um, let's talk about it in specifically with regards to narcissists. Like, is it necessary that I forgive the narcissist? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? Is it beneficial? Um, do, and how can I do it? Is it possible to do it without some sort of reconciliation, right? Without somebody giving you an apology because, you know, narcissists are very unlikely to ever give you a heartfelt, truly empathetic um, apology. It's not in their wheelhouse, right? They just don't have that ability. If they do apologize, it's a crocodile tear sort of fake apology, usually to manipulate, but like, are they able to, you know, apologize and really mean it? No, not really. So you're probably never gonna get that. You're not, you're not gonna get in a real apology from a narcissist. So that form, like that sort of, um, you know, are they gonna do penance for what they've done or, or some sort of transactional where they did some sort of penance for the harms they caused? That's very unlikely to happen again in the narcissistic dynamic. So can you forgive one of these people um, from a place of no contact where there is no reconciliation and there is no apology and there is no accountability for the harms they've caused? Can you find yourself, if you're the victim, in a state of forgiveness? Um, well, I kind of look at it like, you know, like, first of all, when you leave, the, let's talk about this one thing. When you leave a narcissist, you may still be having residual pain and suffering. In fact, most likely you are. That's why you're on this channel. And, you know, it hurts. And why does it hurt? Well, you know, and you, you may look at the narcissist and be like, wow, they're just going on with, with their lives. They, in this new relationship, they were cheating, they overlapped, they absolutely didn't even seem to suffer. They lost their children, they lost their stepchildren, they don't seem to care, there's just no bonding there. It's really weird, right? But what you need to know about that is, is that, and you already know this, it only takes one person to form a bond, a relationship. That is sort of the nature of the narcissistic relationship. You didn't know that because you were assuming that they were bonding with you the way you were bonding with them or some some form of bonding was occurring that was re reciprocal because they usually sent a very good mask of this bond, right? This, But they didn't actually have it. So you were bonding, you were investing, you were putting energy and time, and they weren't. They may have had a facade of doing that, but they really weren't investing emotionally. And really think of it like when the narcissist leaves your life or you leave the narcissist and you've gone no contact, you're having nothing to do with them, you still have this residual pain, 
that can be kind of likened to a death. You know, if you, if somebody dies around you, you're still, you know, if you love them and you bonded with them, you may still feel a residual bond or attachment to that person who has died. So, you know, in that regard, relationships can be one sided where one person is bonded and the other one isn't, or in the, in the, it, with death, somebody's dead, they're gone, but you're still bonded to them. That is, um, you know, not, you know, that, that's, that's fairly normal. It doesn't always happen that way, but it certainly, you know, does happen. So again, in these narcissistic relationships, it was really one-sided. There was no reciprocity. The narcissist, you know, you're in a relationship where the narcissist cares for themselves and themselves alone. And then the other party, the victim cares for the narcissist and themselves. So they're caring for both the people. The narcissist is very, um, you know, only concerned with themselves. Um, so let's kind of go over, you know, is it necessary? Is it helpful? And is it possible to forgive a narcissist? Um, well, I don't know if it's actually necessary. I don't know. I can't really speak. I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's going to be for each person. Um, is it helpful? I believe so. Is it possible? Absolutely. Um, the reasons I think it's helpful is the reasons that I talked about before, an increase in your mental health, uh, an increased sense of well-being. Um, you're no longer drinking the poison and expecting the other person to die. A decrease in your anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, anger, all of those to me are absolutely phenomenal reasons for forgiving a narcissist because you want to cut that tie that binds. And again, it's not about them. It's not about condoning what they did. It's not about forgetting. It's about you getting free. So how do we do this? And especially if reconciliation is, isn't possible. And I am not advocating that you should break no contact and communicate with the narcissist. Um, I know for myself, I actually made it full amends to the narcissist um, a couple weeks before I left the relationship. And so I'm really clean on my side of the street. And I feel like whole and complete in that. Um, so that was really helpful for me. I didn't realize that there was an affair and the double life and all that. I discovered that later, but I still had made a really um, very detailed, heartfelt amends, like even in the middle of the relationship. Um, of course, at the time I was thinking everything was my, my fault and I've since been, you know, woke. I've been, awo I'm awake now and I know the truth, but, um, you know, are you, can you forgive without empathizing? I do think this is, I'm not saying it's absolutely necessary, but it's a lot easier if you can empathize with the narcissist. And I understand that this is so difficult to do, but if you're on these channels, you've done a ton of research, you do understand probably a lot more about where they're coming from, how they think so differently than impasse and sort of codependence. And can you try to understand their worldview? Um, I can now, I think I can, I have a pretty good, um, understanding of what it would be like to be in that place of pain. And I do see it as a place of pain. I imagine being in, you know, a relationship where all I am concerned about is myself and what I can get out of it. And other people are sort of objects and I'm going to use them for validation or for whatever I want from them. But at the deep core of all humans, I believe we have a need for connection. We have a desire to connect, to bond. And I, I believe that narcissists are probably not exempt from that. I really think they still have that because after all, we're all humans, right? So they have that somewhere in them, even though it's been, it's been stifled and stuffed and ignored and, and, and sort of shut off. So if somebody has that and the result is the way that they're behaving and their ways of being in the world is that they are prohibiting that true deep connection and intimacy and authenticity with another human being. That's so sad to me because it's like a gap. It's a huge gap between this, this innate human desire to connect and bond and to have, and to be loved for who we are. And then the reality of what their existence is like, which is this, this very empty, disconnected, um, you know, inability to bond with their children, with their spouse, with their friends, no real connection to humanity. And that to me 
for who I am as an empath and like even a codependent, like that to me would be the worst death that would to be so disconnected from my true self and from others that I am like, that sounds like the most lonely, isolated, sad, pathetic state of being. Like I can't even, it seems so awful to me, like this dark place to be living. So I am able to now see that and I have pity for that. I have pity um, for somebody that's in that state. I have pity for somebody who, um, you know, is only knows how to burn up relationships, only knows how to, um, you know, idealize, devalue, discard, who who doesn't see humans as the, their fully um, complex, curious, interesting people. Like, I, I'm so curious about humans. I love like, you know, exploring the human mind and the emotions of humans. And, and I really am very interested in people and, and what's going on with them and what's going on inside of them. And, and I can't, I mean, it's just, to me, it would be so sad to really only be interested in like this surface level, like relationship with others, like how unfulfilling, how empty, how um, just disconnected and sort of sad that would be, right? Like just to have all your relationships be like these surface shallow relationships. So um, I, I think if that can help you to try to tap into your empathy, I'm not saying that you need to condone their horrible behaviors. I know there was cheating, there was lying, there was gaslighting, there was manipulation, there was all of this stuff. But I'm just saying like, it's not a good place to be. That headspace of a narcissist or a cluster B, I wouldn't wish that headspace on my worst enemy. So if you can start tapping into this ability to empathize, and I'm not saying you should do this, um, you know, to slip on your compassion and to take them back. I'm not saying you should do this and even talk to them. I'm saying, you know, start trying to do it in your heart. Like, and, and sometimes if you believe in the divine, you can ask for God's help to help you have a forgiving heart, to help heal your heart. And, you know, I know it's a really hard place to reach, but, and not everyone can necessarily reach that place, but that's okay even if you can't. If you can't reach that place of being able to empathize with the narcissist, that's okay. I think you can still act in forgiveness. I think that you can still get some forgiveness. And I think what a lot of that has to do with is making the decision that you are going to no longer invest anything in to the relationship with the narcissist, even if they're completely out of your life, you are not going to invest any mental energy, any emotional energy, any psychic energy, any mental, nothing. You are going to reject the narcissist in your life. Not everyone, just the narcissist. Like I am rejecting you having any rent space in my head, having any influence on my existence anymore. So it's kind of like, in some sense, it's almost like it's a, re your, forgiveness is sort of like rejection. Like you're saying, I simply refuse to invest anything else into this relationship. No more emotional energy, no more anger, no more rage, none of that. I'm not going to invest anything else. I already over-invested, probably you did, if you were you know, codependent or if you're an empath, you're a giver, you were pathologically giving to this relationship. And I would say, you know, make a decision that it's time to stop. You're not going to invest anything else into any psychic energy or emotional energy or time or anything into that relationship. Like it's, it's a done, you're done. And you know, I know that that's a really difficult thing to do, but I do believe that that's like part of the step towards the forgiveness piece. And, um, you, you're just no longer going to invest into it. And you're not going to put any more energy into that person. You are going to spend your time on healthy relationships that are reciprocal, the relationship with yourself. You're going to take all that energy that you've been investing into this narcissist discovering blah, 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 all this stuff you've been doing, and you're going to start investing it into yourself, into radical self-care, into healing the parts of you that have porous boundaries or healing the parts of you that say you're not good enough or healing the parts of you that are looking for something on the outside to fill you up, you know, whether it be, um, you know, whatever validation, approval, any of that, like you don't need 
anything external to fill you up. You just need the internal state of peace and well-being, and I believe a connection to God. So for me, like I'm asking for God to fill up this hole inside of me that says that I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not whatever it is that I think, my perfectionism, my crazy human perfectionism, which is absolutely the voice of, as Anne Lamott puts it, um, perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor. It will keep you cramped and insane your whole life. You are lovable, you are worthy, and you do not need, especially somebody who disordered to validate um, you know, your, who you are or your worthiness, like you're worthy. You don't need a narcissist to tell you that you're worthy. I, I have to be honest, like they are the least qualified. They are not the purveyor of worthiness. It's not their, um, they, they're not an expert in that at all. They, they have no self-worth internally, although they hide that. Um, so they're not the people that can tell you how to feel about you. And in fact, nobody is, nobody actually gets to tell you how to feel about you. This is between you and God and it's an inside job or a higher power or however you want to look at the universe, spirit, whatever you get to decide how you feel about you. And that's up to you, not up to anybody else to tell you that you're worthy. And so I think once you stop giving the narcissist rent space in your head and you stop investing any energy into that relationship anymore. And of course, if you can empathize with them, it's helpful, but do not slip on your compassion. It just helps, I think, to be able to <coughs> sort of put yourself in somebody else's shoes and imagine that worldview. And you know, when I started doing that, man, I'm telling you what happened for me is a lot of compassion started to come into my heart. And yeah, a lot of pity, you know, and, and, and I have a lot of pity for somebody who's so disconnected from their true self that they think they have to be perfect in order to be loved. And they're going around just wrecking havoc on all their relationships. That's an awful place. You know, the state of unforgiveness, the state of, um, toxic self-centeredness. I mean, that is, that is not a healthy uh, place to live. And so I, I just, like I said, I imagine being in that person's shoes and I'm filled with um, gratitude that I don't live there. I'm filled with so much gratitude that I live in a state of joy, not all the time, but a lot of the time. So I'm so grateful for that. So I don't know if this is helpful for you, but again, I talked about in another video that if you can start praying for them to have peace, love, joy, happiness, all the things you want for yourself, I know that's a really tall order and you might not f feel like doing that, but I do believe that there's some great healing that may occur if you try that simple um, task. So thank you so much and I hope you're thriving and doing really well. Have a great day. Bye.